So good evening, everyone. My name is Lynette Davis with LynetteDavis.com. And I am coming to you live, uh, obviously, <laughs> on Facebook. Um, I wrote a post earlier this week, or maybe it was later last, late last week, um, about wanting to talk about anxiety. And um, this topic has kind of been on my heart and mind for a while. And so I wanted to just kind of talk about it from a very non-technical standpoint. Okay, thank you. Good, you can hear me. <laughs> um, in light of it being Mental Health Awareness Month, which is now May. Uh, typically, I will do a series on my blog for Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and typically, if I do video, it'll, it'll normally be an interview. But I decided um, at the last minute to just kind of free run this um, and bring in somebody next month. But I will tell you a little bit more about that towards the end. So... Um, so I decided to focus specifically on anxiety this month because um, we are still in the pandemic. And for the most part, many of us have been um, sheltering away and now we're kind of breaking free. And I've been seeing different um, articles and things of that nature about kind of feeling a little awkward now that you know, some of these barriers are kind of being lifted and people are starting to engage socially with other people again. And they're feeling a little bit anxious about um, how we're navigating this new normal in 2021. And uh, so I kind of wanted to just bring it in on a more personal note, and see if anybody resonated with with some personal uh, stories. So. Um, if you don't know, as I've been sharing, I am currently in seminary and I'm a full-time student in seminary right now. And um, I am still running my business at the same time alongside a, a whole bunch of other commitments. And so um, interestingly enough, uh, in addition to pandemic stuff, my and in, in now being in the school and trying to balance all these things, um, I thought that I would be kind of okay with um, being having to stay at home because I've been working from home since mm, 2010, I think. Um, so I kind of kind of was a little a little arrogant about being able to handle working from home and not really being able to socialize with friends and, th and, and things of that nature. Uh, but it turns out that my anxiety has really just shot through the roof. Um, now, mind you, I'm also an introvert. So the being at home and staying away from people, that has worked out really well for me. <laughs> but the anxiety, the anticipation of what if and what could be really kind of drove my anxiety and school itself actually has been a really huge factor in um the increase of my anxiety and <laughs> i have to say nothing's really shocking about that of all of the different triggers that i have school has actually always been one of my largest ones um i can remember from the time that i was a little girl like always like around report card time, I would have panic attacks. And my mom could probably attest to this, like every report card, panic attack time. Um, and so for some reason, it didn't connect that those were symptoms of anxiety when I was a child. Um, and so by the time I became an adult and had all of these different factors show up, it was kind of like, what do you mean I have anxiety? But if I go back and look at my history, uh, looking at all those instances of having panic attacks in school to the point of 
um, bearing physical symptoms. Uh, I was always in the nurse's office. Like my panic attacks would be so bad. I would actually give myself nosebleeds. Um, now, mind you, I went to a school where there was only air conditioning in the principal's office and in the nurse's office. So I was kind of lucking out by having my nosebleeds and always going to the nurse's office. Um, as a matter of fact, the nurse knew me so well, they like had an ice pack already waiting for me. That's how much I was in the, in the nurse's office because I would have my panic attacks and constantly have these nosebleeds. Um, and so I kind of grew up with these things kind of sitting in the corner in the crevices of my way of being and engaging in my life. And um, as I got older, it just showed up in different ways. Obviously, uh, one of the most grateful things I would say is I stopped the nose bleeding, but my physical symptoms transformed and they transformed into very adult problems, um, such as migraines, insomnia, gut issues, GERD. So um, I began to really experience that connection between mental and emotional states and physical health and began to really see the importance of tending to your mental health uh, to prevent physical illness. Uh, so um, what has really showed up for me is as I was digging into what is anxiety and what does it look like without big scientific terms, um, I started to really dwell on the fact that it's not often mentioned that anxiety is actually normal and um, was something that was kind of <laughs> embedded in our DNA for centuries and centuries um, as a kind of a healthy response um, to circumstances that would lead us to fight or flight. What changes, however, is that when it becomes a disorder, something that's diagnosed, then it becomes something that's unhealthy. And that looks like, for me personally, um, it starts off as something that is anxious thoughts, excessive worrying, um, and irrational fear. And, um, and it's, it's very perversive. Um, it doesn't kind of really taper off over the years. I've just learned different ways to manage it. Um, so for instance, like I said, school happens to be a trigger for me. So going into the school year, you know, I had all this worry and, and anxiety and stress, all of these things compounded. Uh, which irritated my anxiety that I, I had pretty fairly under control. Um, but as pressure came on for finals, for committee meetings, for being able to balance my schedule, for being able to navigate this pandemic and all of the terrible news that's constantly in our faces, I really just was no good, y'all. <laughs> so... I, um, some of the, of the things that kind of showed up for me, uh, was the way I interacted in class, um, constantly having this, um, imposter syndrome show up in a really, really drastic way. So, you know, whereas some people are like, okay, well, you're an introvert. You might be a little shy. No, I was rambling. <laughs> I would ramble and try to overcompensate um, because I want it to be perceived as normal. Um, I wanted to hide behind an exterior version of myself so that I could kind of fit in with other people who were there um, for academic reasons, if maybe they were perhaps later pursuing their doctorate or people who were going to be doing some really heavy hitting work a lot at my particular seminary there's a lot of activists 
there's a lot of aspiring pastors and chaplains. And so while I was sitting there, I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing here. And I don't know what I could contribute to, to this environment. Um, and so that sat with me over and over again. And I would kind of show up in a really um, kind of seeming like I'm much more in- extroverted than I really am. And then kind of cower later with sleepless nights, with migraines. Um, and with other physical symptoms that I won't go too, too much into. So I just kind of wanted to just share that sometimes we think people have it all together, (laughs) but behind the scenes, behind the smiles and the lip gloss that we put on, I just put some lip gloss on for (laughs) y'all, that there's actually a lot of inner battles taking place. There's a lot of struggle and it's not that these things aren't manageable, um, but it's really good that there's a month to bring some of these things to awareness, to let people know that um, you're not the only one. You're not the only one going through the things that you're going through. So what I've learned is that you require different tools for different phases of your life and your mental health recovery. Sometimes the things that work before given new circumstances don't necessarily work today. And that happened to be something that went, um, that took place for me. Like I had tools of recovery. As a matter of fact, I'll share one with you. This is a pocket size. This is my pocket size wrap. And what the RAP program is, is uh, basically you set up a plan that has wellness tools. You write down your triggers, your trigger, your trigger action plan, then early warning signs, then the action plan for that, then when things are getting worse. And these are just identifying all of the different things in different phases of your mental health before you get to crisis mode. So, you know, um, I won't share all mine, but, (laughs) um, you know, I wrote some triggers for like early warning signs, what I could look out for and just kind of keeping this forefront for me has been actually really helpful. And then I write, wrote down all of the different tools that I could try. And so, this was helpful because it helped me to know, hey, something's not quite right. And having it documented and in this pocket size, they're actually a full size one. I just like the pocket size one because it's easier. It's mobile. It's more mobile. Um, has been really helpful for me. And again, that program is called RAT. Um, but I learned that sometimes some of my tools that used to work for me, um, they didn't work so much in these circumstances. And so... This past year, I experimented with some new things. And um, so I wanted to share three with you that worked. And I'm going to post this on my blog if I did this right in this recording um, and open up a forum to hear any suggestions that you would like to add to the conversation about tools and resources that have worked for you during the pandemic and having this anxiety. And again, Remember, there's anxiety and then there's anxiety disorder, um, which is a which is a diagnose a diagnosable mental health um, condition. And so um, why anxiety is quite normal um, when it comes when it becomes a disorder. Well, you need some different measures. So for me, obviously, my first go to resource is a therapist. And I actually started with a new therapist um, at the tail end of 2020 when I first uh, started the fall semester. I had um, previously kind of stopped going to talk therapy because I didn't need it so much at the time. And I just kind of relied on mental health peer support groups, both attending my own and facilitating them. Um, and that actually was kind of keeping me pretty even, even kill for a while. 
Um, but when the school year began, I was like, I think I might need to step up. Like I knew myself, I know that school triggers me. So I knew myself well enough. So I sought out a new therapist. First of all, um, one of the most important aspects of seeking out a mental health therapist is that you want to have somebody who like, you don't feel like you need to explain who you are or give definitions to certain things um, where it feels like you're schooling them more so than they're helping you. Um, and so it was really important for me to find a therapist that looked like me. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited because this, this past year, I finally worked with a therapist who's a black woman. And honestly, as I've been in mental health recovery for a little over 10 years now, this is the very first time, literally the very first time I've ever had a therapist who looks like me. <laughs> um, so that's saying a lot right there. Um, and it has been actually just having a, a mental health therapist that um, just understands you culturally is actually like a bonus on top of getting care. Um, and so I, I, I typically try to put resources in so that you can find therapists that are um, inclusive and culturally diverse so that there's an opportunity for you to find um, therapists that you feel like might work more so for you. So, you know, there's therapists who are very much so out and about as uh, fully out LGBTQIA+. There's therapists who are deaf. Um, there's therapists who are from the Asian community, from indigenous community. So there's so many different resources to find um, therapists that we just really did not have access to before in the past. So I'm really impressed with sometimes <laughs> the way the internet works and how we're able to finally pull these resources together. Um, so that aside, um, I was able to find a therapist during this time. And um, she introduced me to some techniques I had not really tried before that not only helped me with my anxiety, but also um, incorporated some body techniques um, because my anxiety symptoms affected my body, um, namely like GERD, um, you know, trying to help me also with dietary um, I wouldn't say restrictions, but a dietary plan so that I could really try my hardest to avoid food that would trigger even worse GERD symptoms than I would normally have. Um, so I had I gave up caffeine years ago. But when I started school with the pandemic, let me tell you, I've been eating all the chocolate. <laughs> so so, of course, chocolate is caffeine and it has just really messed with my body. So I need to get back on my leave the leave the caffeine alone. Um, but also caffeine is not really good if you have anxiety. <laughs> it's a bad combination. Um, so one of the techniques that she introduced me to, and actually I was familiar with it before, um, but I had never really engaged with it, was tapping. And um, I thought that was actually a really interesting technique for a therapist to give me. But um, I purposely chose a therapist who is a classical licensed clinician, uh, social worker, um, who also had certifications in holistic health. Like I wanted to make sure that I had a nice balance. And so one of the, the resources and tools that she gave me was um, we had a couple of sessions where we did tapping techniques. And um, I found that tapping was very distracting <laughs> in a good way. Um, and during the session of doing the tapping, that really worked for me. So I'll be sure to put a resource in about tapping if you've never heard of it. But basically, it's kind of like you kind of do that, that it's like different pressure points on your body where you're where you're tapping. Um, to kind of help center yourself and reframe whatever it is that's bothering you at that time and get you out of that negative headspace. 
So um, I found that really helpful. So that was something new that I experimented with this year that um, I didn't really have access to before. Um, another thing that, another tool, cause I, I promised three <laughs> and I wasn't counting therapy. Um, another tool that has been very useful to me is what I do with my technology. I had heard that Blu-rays and technology was kind of affecting sleep, but I was not aware of how much. So when I had insomnia, which I had insomnia for about three months, um, it was suggested for me to change and um, to change my lighting settings on my laptop and on my phone. And also to literally pick up my little phone, this phone is old as dirt, y'all, <laughs> and turn it off and walk it out of the room um, because of the signals and the, I, you know, all those technical things that I really don't know what it is or the names of the terminology. But what I do know is that when I change the settings on my phone to help with that blue light stuff, um, my insomnia started going away. Go figure. I think it also helped that I had made it a point that at nine o'clock PM, my phone was off. Um, I turned off the phone and I got into prayer mode, centering prayer specifically, um, which actually was a requirement for class, but now I'm kind of glad that I had to do it. Um, and just staying away from technology. Like that of all of the tools, that one was the only one I didn't feel like it was extra homework which was really helpful to me because I felt like everything was a to-do list and that was finally a to-don't. Um, it was very easy to just change my blue, my blue light settings. Um, I'm trying to think what it was called. And finally, cause I was not going to stay here all night because now that I am done for the semester, I am catching up on anime <laughs> blue light filter. That's it. Um, and so I have an appointment with Anna maybe for nine o'clock hits. So, <laughs> but um, the last one um, is I started engaging in a community support care um, that is a, a meditation group facilitated by my friend Alexis who I met at Mystic Soul Project, the conference in Chicago that I went to um, so shout out to Mystic Soul Project. If you're not familiar with them, I've, I've written about them before. That's who I went on my pilgrimage to Spain with. And I've been kind of associating with them and people I've met since then. And so Alexis started um, a meditation circle that he hosts every Saturday. And it centers um, practices that embrace um, LGBTQ plus identity, um, people of color. And sometimes you don't think about, oh, do I really need that type of space until you get into it. And like, what's been powerful about that space is not so not just the meditation practices, which I have to say, they're definitely different from um, other meditation spaces that I've been in before where I just, I couldn't calm down. Like <laughs> I could not get focused in the meditation. I was just like, when is this over? Um, but I didn't have that problem here. And I think it's because one, um, Alexis is a fabulous facilitator. Um, and two, but because I'm surrounded by people who are doing wonderful, beautiful work and I get to know them. Like, it's not just about, oh, it's the Alexis show. Um, we all get to kind of talk to each other, engage each other, and just hold space for one another before we even get into the meditation. And that honestly has been so very special to me. Um, and I didn't think I would want to go to another Zoom thing. Um, and I, I would have to say that I've given myself permission to not have to be on all the time. Like, um, I think we need to do that sometimes. Like, it's like, all right, I need to get healthy. So let me attend this and that and that. And then you get overwhelmed from that. 
So just really giving yourself permission to try new techniques in the midst of it. If the things that you have tried before just aren't working, then open yourself up to experiment with things that maybe you tried before and it didn't work out. Um, or you learned about in passing, for instance, tapping. I had learned about in passing. I didn't pay any mind and it resurfaced for me. Um, and meditation, which I had written off because I was like, I'm sorry, I can't sit down and, <laughs> and hum. So, um, but there's so many different forms of meditation. And, and, you know, we read all the time, oh, meditation and exercise is good for anxiety. And that's great to read about it. But um, I think what I've learned is sometimes something that doesn't work at one point in your life, it's worth giving it a try in another point of your life. You'd be surprised what you'll be open to, especially as you learn more about different ways of being in it. So those are the tools, the three tools that I wanted to share after sharing my, my nosebleed story with you <laughs> about how anxiety has shown up for me, um, mainly through school. I just wanted to kind of focus that in and not get all scientific about it. Um, so next month, if you don't know, is Pride Month. And so I kept bragging about Alexis. And so I'm going to bring him, them on. Uh, they use both he and they pronouns. Um, and we're going to talk about mental health and the LGBTQIA plus identity and we're going to talk about meditation and other techniques that we are doing and using to really um, offer and be in community care support settings during this time. And I think that's going to be amazing. So I cannot wait to introduce you to, to them. And um, if you can't tell, I have the smash the stigma shirt on that i have been advertising this is our new shirt and so i'm going to drop a link for the shirt if you would like to uh get one i was going to use like an old term and then that would have probably gave up my age so i'm not going to do that because <laughs> it's probably an out of style term but yeah so thank you so much for listening hopefully the volume and everything stay rolling this entire time. Thank you for tuning in. Again, I'm going to put this on my blog, lynettedavis.com. Hopefully it recorded. If not, I'll like do bullet points or something. Uh, <laughs> with a list of resources for some of the tools that I mentioned, as well as things I probably didn't mention because this is unscripted, y'all. This is the first draft. So um, I'll be sure to do that. And um, also along with uh, an invitation, as soon as I figure out the exact date, I'll keep you posted on when we will do that interview, but it will be next month during Pride Month. And I hope to see you then. So until next time, peace, love, and wellness.